everybody. All right, so let's get into the Word tonight. We're going to look at Romans chapter 13. It's a foundational strip, uh, scripture, um, and we're talking about understanding spiritual authority. You have to understand that God is a God of structure. God is a God of authority. God is a God that places those that He chooses to be in authority. It doesn't mean uh, God values one above another. It just means that He's given uh, gifts and talents to individuals, both men and women, that, that, um, that He gives them to be able to help grow the church and, and fulfill the Great Commission. And so, but there has to be structure and authority to fulfill uh, the full length, depth, breadth, and height of all we're called to do. How many want to stand before the Lord when we come before Him on that great day of judgment to give an account of what we are supposed to do here in this earth? How many want to know that you fulfilled the, re- the length, the breadth, the depth, and the height? Well, you're going to have to sit up underneath God's structure of authority and learn, and, and God will, little by little, um, you know, help you fulfill the will of God for your life. My wife and I are getting, to, getting ready to go minister to, um, to our southeast region of, of ministers. And, and sometimes when you, when you get amongst people that are preachers, that helps ministry, or this, that, or the other, uh, some people only think that the, the speaker is valuable. No. You're just as valuable We would have no ministry without the helps ministry. Anybody glad here tonight your youth are being ministered to right now at their point of need, not just with, you know, a cultural event, but the Word of God and the presence of God and our kids and all the different things we offer here at Harvest. Um, But it's so important that we learn structure and authority and that you learn that success, in my definition, is reaching your full potential in what God has for you. Rather than, oh, success would be if I just had a multi-whatever kind of business. Well, if that's God's will for you, you know, there's, there's those, there are those in the, in the body of Christ that are graced to give. They can give more uh, by accident than we give on purpose because they, the, they, they have the gift of, of business. And that's good. That's because, you know, the, the um, church needs to be funded. Anybody here like air conditioning? How many has your car, uh, how many of your air conditioning in your car has busted recently? And mine's a compressor. So you know what? It might not be two months till you get it. My goodness, every time I get in my car, I have a sauna going there and a sauna going there. I get a facial. All my pores are open. And, and anyway, that's not fun. But... Um, Romans 13, 1 through 7, God's structure of authority, understanding spiritual authority. Let every person be loyally subject to governing civil authorities. You know, when, when, when you read a verse just like this, it said, let every person be loyally subject to the governing civil authorities, it doesn't mean you submit to them in things not in alignment with the Word of God. There is no such thing. Say it with me. There's no such thing. There's no such thing as unconditional submission to authority. The Holy Spirit and the Word and the Father, they all agree. So if you're telling me you've got direction by the Holy Spirit and you're violating the Word of God or it divides, it's not, a good, it's not good leadership when they divide. Good leaders unite. Good leaders bring together. Good leaders build morale. Good, good leaders help people. Fulfill their purpose. Go on, for there is no authority except from God, by His permission, His sanction, and those that exist do so by God's appointment. So I, I want to just caution you because in leadership, we have to mention names sometimes. Uh, for instance, when, when a minister has gotten off doctrinally, we, we will sometimes have to mention them because they are so visible to the public. And we don't want, um, we got to protect the sheep. When, um, when there's times where, where 
the president or, or whoever, uh, um, Supreme Court, or, you know, just go down the line of those who are making decisions in authority that are not in alignment with the Word of God, we can't follow that. But we don't put our mouth against them in a derogatory, in a foul-mouthed way because guess what? They might, not, they might not be the right person in position, but God sanctions that position. So to put your mouth against authority will get you in trouble. So around our house or in leadership meetings, I, I say this. I say this with fear and trembling, and I'm not saying this destructively. I'm saying this constructively, but I've got to point something out that I want you to be aware of that's not right. I could, I could go way into that, but right now, let's just move on. And, um, number two, therefore, he who resists and sets himself up against authorities, who are they, who are they really resisting? Resists what God has appointed and arranged in divine order. And those who resist will bring down judgment upon themselves, receiving the penalty due them. And I could just hear it right now. So if we're, not, if, if we're opposed to what government's doing would it ever be appropriate that we would stand up for our rights? Well, sure, the, sure you stand up, could stand up for your rights. Just do it right. You can express your opinion, you, you, you can, but you don't show up like that militaristic church that goes to funerals with military people and dog them. No. You, you, can, uh, you can resist or bring public... Um, push back like Martin Luther King. Great example. So we can do it right, but watch how, watch how, watch how you put your mouth against authority because, you know, you can do it constructively rather than destructively. No sound. And those who resist will bring down judgment upon themselves, receiving the penalty due them. For civil authorities are not a terror to the people of good conduct, but to those of bad behavior. Would you have no dread of him who is in authority? Then do what's right. And you'll receive his approval and commendation. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, you should dread him. Be afraid. I've said this before, no matter what, I could be going right 55, but if I see blue flashing lights, I still swallow deep. Come on, what? <laughs> am I doing something? Oh, my. I, I, I have a healthy f- fear and respect for authority. And um, I, I'm studying for three messages. That's why I'm sort of <laughs> a little bit all over the place tonight. But I'm studying for Sunday's message, and I'm studying for the minister's message when I go out there, and, and also for Wednesday night. And, and it's just so very important that we understand these basic principles that civil authorities, they're not a terror to those people who conduct themselves right. But, but again, if you put your mouth or resist authority, like, for instance, um, you might be real good at your job, and all of a sudden somebody come up to you and say, you know what, you ought to be in charge. You, man, if you were in charge, you could do a whole lot better job than that person. Now, this is switching into my ministers, minister to ministry. The minister is coming. King David had a son named Absalom, and his son wasn't satisfied with his position as a son. He would stand at the gate, and as people came in and people came out with going in to see the king or can't see the king, he said, you know what, I understand right where you're coming from. If I were king, if I were in position, listen, don't say things like that because even if when a person's doing their job good and they're grace and gifted by God, they make it look easy. So if you try it without the grace and the anointing and, and, and you know, get out of your lane, so to speak, it's not going to look so pleasing on you. 
But the reason Absalom got in trouble is because of pride. He began to see, think of himself higher than he ought to. When you do something good and people give you compliments, don't let that get to your head. Don't say, oh, no, all authority and honor to God. Don't, don't act like that. Say, thank you. I'm glory to God. Thank you. Don't be weird about it. But keep in, keep in the right mind frame that, uh, you know, um, thank you for that. But I'm not going to, I'm going to rely on God more the next time. <laughs> All right. Verse 4, for he, authority is God's servant for good. But if you do wrong, you should dread him. Be afraid, for he does not bear and wear the, so the sword for nothing. He's God's servant to execute his wrath, punishment, vengeance on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be subject, not only to avoid God's wrath and escape punishment, but also as a matter of principle and for the sake of your conscience. You'll know you missed it when your conscience hurt you about that thing you just said about them, or a family member, or a church member. Or, oh, man, you sing better than them. You ought to be up there in the praise team. I think you need to be in charge. When you hear stuff like that, don't entertain that kind of talking. No. Uh, you know, thank God we all have our place. How many want the presence of God stronger and stronger as the days get darker and darker? It's going to require unity. It's going to require one vision. It's going to require us all working together, happy, happy to just be in our grace and our place, fulfilling our race, and, and, and just uh, becoming the highest level that God ever intended us to be, full potential. For the same reason you pay taxes, oh, I had to, boy, this is a positive, upbeat sermon tonight. For this same reason, <laughs> come on now, uh, you pay taxes for the civil authorities. They're official servants under God, devoting themselves to attending to the very service. Render all men their dues. Pay taxes to whom pa uh, taxes are due. Revenue to whom revenue is due. Respect to whom respect is due. Honor to whom honor is due. So God's kingdom is established on authority. We need to know about authority, learn how to respect authority while making sure there is proper authority over them as well as over us. The dictionary definition, I'm just condensing some things here, says uh, authority is the power or right to do something, particularly to give or see orders that they be followed because they were delegated authority. You don't go and take over something if, if you didn't give, you weren't given that position or you weren't given that delegated authority over that area. Acts 20, 28 says, take care, be on guard for yourselves and the whole flock over whom Aunt Cindy uh, made you, uh, appointed you bishops. No, so, let God choose what you do. You know, your purpose, it's not hidden from you, it's hidden for you because God unveils it step by step, and it's going to take faith to walk it out every step of the way. If you're wondering ultimately what you are, God's not going to tell you. He'll show you the next step. I, I've shared this story. It's worth repeating with the Bible college, and, <laughs> and uh, you know, there had to be some maturing in that group too. Because I heard so much talk about, so what are you? Oh, I'm like Elijah. I have the double portion anointing, Elisha. And then what are you? I'm a pastor. What are you? I'm a bishop. What are you? I'm a teacher. Uh, what are you? I'm like, I didn't even know what I was. So when I say serve your way to your destiny, it's because I've had to. I didn't care what I ultimately was going to be. I just want to fulfill the will of God for my life and stand before God not having fulfilled your purpose, but my purpose. Yeah. 
talking to pastors, over which the Holy Spirit has appointed you bishops and guardians. Bishop is an overseer, so, I mean, uh, some people use that term. To shepherds, tend and feed and guide the church, the family of God, which he obtained for himself by buying it, saving it for himself with his own blood. I didn't decide what I was going to be. I discovered what it was going to be through purpose, through progression, through one step leading to another step, and so forth. That's why it's so important to be consistent in your walk with God and in your involvement in the local church. Too often I've heard people come up to me after they hear one exciting sermon saying, Pastor Cohen, I believe I'm called to go to Ramah. I said, I believe you're called to come to church consistently first. And what team are you on? We mean what team? I, I played basketball in school. No, I'm talking about well, where, are you, where are you serving? Oh, but God's sending me to the nations. No. You got to first learn to lead yourself. Amen. Then you got to get involved and learn submission to authority and, and walk in alignment with the word. And you're going to be in situations where you could think it could be done better a certain way, but someone else does it a certain way. Submit to it. Don't become a problem. Now, I'm the type of leader, I want all you have as far as pushback, this, that, you know, and, and, and respect, because I want to maximize my team. I want buy-in. I want, I want the best idea. But that meeting might have already taken place, and you weren't even in the meeting. Excuse me. All right, then. This is awesome. So I had to go through the process that qualified me for every step. Some of you are in a very, some of you are in a in a very uncomfortable season. If you skip the season, you'll not be ready for the next. Whatever you're going through, your highest expression of faith is not when everything's going perfect. It's when you get a bad report, you keep, you still keep saying the same thing. When you feel like everything's going negative. I don't get up here and try messages out on you. <laughs> I come in here and like dad, well, dad, I call dad hash. Uh, uh, he said, listen, when I talk about bringing financial peace to you is because I've worked these principles for a few decades now. And, and, and I'm, I don't say this for, for any, any other reason that someone's got to be an example this church owes no person, nothing. Glory to God. Now, God, God, I mean, we worked the principles, though, and we could have done other things except eliminate debt. But we've still been able to do a lot of ministry while eliminating debt, and, and now um, we're able to do a bunch of cash flow projects, and, and, and also I'm talking financial peace I'm like, because I'm debt-free, personally. And this church has strong reserves, and so do I. Who's got a cricket thingy, cricket app, you know, go, cricket, cricket. And I'm wanting to get you there because you can. But you got to be willing to do what my wife and I did over the years, and she didn't put pressure on me. And we established a budget that we both go to work toward. I never hid anything from her. I would always talk to her about different things, so... Folks, as I continue to gracefully go, grow older, I, I, will not, I will not be a weight on anybody, including the church, my wife and I. We won't. Getting back to God's authority and even sometimes things that you might say, hey, I, I would like to do that. Well, first of all, you can't be developed in something that God does not plan for you to be gifted in. You can't do that. Now, John, you've got different giftings than I do. And you can do things I can't do. So your giftings, you know, help a portion of what we're called to do. And, and I'm different. I have different giftings than you have. And complimenting. Now, think about all the church and people being happy with, with just starting with the basics and consistently serving. All of a sudden, 
Some, somebody might say, Lord, if they talk about volunteers for the children's ministry just one more time, it's going to get on my last nerve. <laughs> well, that could be God calling you to volunteer. And guess what will happen? Sometimes what happens when people just volunteer, all of a sudden they, they fall in love and realize, I'm gifted in this area. I didn't realize serving was this good. It makes me feel this good. Jesus said, my meat is to do the will of my Father which is in heaven. He didn't say my meat was to go to Ruth's Chris and have it, have it you know, the filet mignon. There's nourishment in doing the will of God. There's nourishment in serving. They're, they're just, you're, just not, you're not going to know what that feels like until you just get in that place. And not only that, you'll gain community. And you'll gain someone being in your uh, corner when you go through a battle. And, 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 you know, you look after each other. There's some people that want to be in charge like at the very top so they don't have to submit to anyone. Well, that's not true. If you're at the top, you better have someone above you. First of all, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and, and uh, uh, for, for humor's sake, the Holy Spirit's twin, which is my wife, and she's got some wisdom and counsel. I take heed to it. Some of you guys are getting mad because your wife's right. And instead of receiving, can y'all handle me for about 15 more minutes? Thanks for those three encouraging words here. No, you'll never see me without authority over me. Before God ever developed me into what he called me to do, I, I had to be pastored. I still have to be pastored. I'm a leader of leaders. I'm a pastor to pastors. But I need pastored and I need to be led. And I, I need, I need, man, you guys are getting like ver, three, three messages in one tonight. But here's the deal. You should never grow old enough to not say, yes, ma'am, no, sir, yes, sir, yes, ma'am. And I know people sometimes, I understand when, when people, um, how do I say this? I know who I am, so no one has to tell me what I am. But myself personally, um, Pastor Hagen, he was the first real pastor I had over my life when my wife and I went out to Rama Bible College. And so, might as well go to the last page and uh, ask you to look at this scripture. Uh, put up 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 12 and 13 in the Amplified. 1 Thessalonians 5. Oh, thank you. Good, good, good. Now, here is scripture that will forever be in the Bible is this. Now, also, we beseech you, brethren, get to know those who labor amongst you. So, you ought to be getting to know leadership, or if you're on a serving team, you're, you need to know each other, and you're pulling together, and you're not striving for comp competitive advantage to uh, get promoted. No, no, come on. Now, God's kingdom's upside down. You want to be promoted, you got to go low. you got to hit the deck. Uh, you should never have the ambition to get in leadership so you're served. That's why we call what we... The type of people we raise up here at Harvest Church is servant leaders. You, you get your leadership in front of your servant, and we're going to have some problems. There's a culture Harvest Church has. We have boundaries. We have certain expectations, and, and uh, we've said it before, and, and 
you know, if you're a business person, you ought to put boundaries and you got to have a good manual that has your expectations and you would never have to fire anybody for the rest of your life and, and, and business because if, they're, if they do not fit within those boundaries, they're saying, I no longer want to work here. Because when you came in, you, you knew our expectations. But I don't, I don't agree with them anymore. Well, then you're saying you don't want to work here. So um, uh, go find a place you can do that. Not trying to be mean. However, we maintain unity. So get to know those who labor amongst you in the Lord. Don't, don't be so on the fringes that, you know, People don't know if you're at church or not. Well, I, I did say that, didn't I? I? I said that. I said that out loud even. You didn't like that. Don't hide. Don't think that hiding prevents you from standing before the Lord where the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. You can't, you might say, but I'm not called to be like you. Well, no, but you're called. If you're not called to the fivefold ministry, you're called to, to strive for the various, very, very highest development of your giftings in the helps ministry, which a, is a true anointing. I get amazed when I think I, I could just point out many different people in authority these days. I'm just like, I love the anointings upon their life. I couldn't do that. I'm willing to do anything. And guess what? I don't have to be anointed if there's a need that no one else is filling. Because I'm going to volunteer. Listen, folks, I was praise and worship leader three years. Three, three years. Why? Because we were first starting. I was the, I was the best we could get at that moment. <laughs> but I, I, was, I knew leadership. And I, I would lead songs. I would sing sometimes, but I'd be like Kurt Franklin. I'd sort of talk it through. Because I knew I couldn't hit that note. I'm saying? Yeah. So, you know, you know, I'm going to give you a little secret. You know a praise and worship leader can't really quite get to that note if they say, now, let's sing this together. Or, you know, and, and, but when I was leading praise and worship, there were some people that were more gifted than I singing. I knew they could hit the note, and I'd say, sing it out. <laughs> it's amazing what you can fake. God has a purpose for your life, and part of it is to be productive in the local church, if you've never heard that. You need a pastor over your life. And, and getting back to the scripture that has been so critical in my life, get to know those who labor among you, recognize them for uh, what they are, acknowledge and appreciate, respect them all. Don't be in com competition with people. God, what God has for you is for you. Don't get intimidated when something good happens to someone else. Just know you're in the same line. Just do what you're supposed to do, and you, uh, you'll be blessed. And um, your leaders also get to know those who labor among you and know those who are your leaders who are what? You mean there's leaders supposed to be what? You mean I have to have leaders what? I have leaders over my life. The only way I would stop following them is if there was a catastrophic, immoral situation. Or they were not, they, they got off course or something. That's not the case in my situation. God called my wife and I to, to Rama Bible College and the mandate there and the training there. And we've been f nourishing those roots for 34 years. Tell the person next to you, you look good for your age. <laughs> and then Bishop Passion, Lady Joy, uh, they, you know, the good thing about our leaders, they're better privately than they are publicly. Do you hear what I just said? When you get close to your leader, you're like, what in the... I don't like them. 
You know what's happening in those leaders' lives? If they don't correct themselves in the character issue, they're, they're, they're living off their gifting. They're surfing on their gift rather than the character can that withstand them over the, the time. This good work that God has begun in us, God wants to bring to full completion until the day of Jesus Christ. And that's going to take consistency. That's going to take, you know, again, a pastor is sort of like water. You, 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 uh, you might not only like us because we're not really, well, I got some flavor, don't I? Anyway, uh, what, I, what that means, personality, right? That's all I meant. Uh, You might not want water, but you need us daily to survive. I need my leaders daily to survive. Get to know those who labor amongst you and get to know what? Your leaders who are over you in the Lord. And it bears, bears worth repeating. So I'm in Bible school now. God called us to go out there at Ramah, sitting in a class. And this teacher said, I will stop you right here. He was talking on some content like this. And on the count of three, I want you to answer this question as soon as I clap my hands. One, two, three. Who's over you in the Lord? <laughs> yes, Lord. Okay. Um, you didn't say it out loud, but someone needs to come to your attention because that divine connection is a, is a very important part of you fulfilling the will of God for your life. You have to be exposed to fivefold ministry gift and the anointing that will teach you and the association and the environment that will shape you. And, and I was in that class. I couldn't answer that question. But it was easy once I said, well, who, who, who would be with me in the Lord? Well, at Rain Bible College, we also had Rainbow Bible Church. And to stay in the line with that vision, I'm going to, you know, Pastor Hagman was, was our pastor for about three years. And still in, in leadership over our life, uh, but Bishop, uh, God sent us to Bishop Hash and Lady Joy. And, and I feel like I'm getting in trouble tonight, but might as well go deeper. <laughs> I think, I know it doesn't work in all cases, but I like the fact that Bishop Ash can get a hold of my wife and I physically. We can go see them. We can go and talk with them. I like that. Because long-distance pastoring, I, I, you know, I'm speaking on my own, like Paul said sometimes. But he also did say, I think I'm speaking by the Spirit of God. <laughs> All right, then. Um, get, those, get to know those who labor o, uh, among you and, and your leaders who are over you in the Lord. Guess what they do? They, those who warn you, those who kindly repu <laughs> reprove you. Isn't that wonderful? You'll come into a service and and there'll be a warning going out. Uh, there'll be a warning. There's been several warnings tonight. Don't get in pride because pride and haughtiness comes before a fall and destruction. You ought to be the easiest person to get along with. <laughs> you should. But I wonder what your coworker thinks of you. And immediately you should be able to say, oh, my, or your boss. Listen, someday you're, you, you might be someone else's boss, but guess what you're going to reap? How you treated your boss. <laughs> Isn't that good? What's this section over here think about tonight? You, you all ready to leave? You, a little bit more can handle it? All right, thank you, thank you. And by the way, you're not supposed to follow every minister because you'll be confused. I'm not saying there are, there are all kinds of good ministers, 
but I feed from where I've been rooted and set. God made choice where I was set in the body of Christ. It wasn't my choice. So I feed from them very consistently. And I've seen people get away where God set them, stop feeding, and they are the most miserable people today. Remember those days where you were just at your, just full of joy and, and, and just hungry for the word, and you were set there amongst a, a group of people you knew you were in the will of God. When you heard the word, you were excited. When, when we've, we've had some Holy Spirit days around here where there's been shouting, even dancing and rejoicing, you were in that environment, and you know, you don't know, but yokes are being destroyed, burdens are being removed, and God's delivering some goods there because the will of God is the word of God. That's the will of God. The Holy Spirit is the delivery of what the word says. So sometimes we need, you know, times of refreshing in his presence. So you see here that a pastor warns you. A a good pastor doesn't fear the people they lead. Otherwise, they forfeit the right to lead them. That means you can't be a people pleaser. I, I want everybody to love me. I mean, I am just so lovable. I, I mean, I'm just so um, I'm just a great guy. And uh, <laughs> oh, sorry about that. I see some looks I'm getting. Um, but I'm not afraid of you. Well, I'm, I've been threatened before. But I'm, I'm just going to take my tithe out here. And I, you know what I tithe. You know what I tithe. I say, first of all, I don't. Because I don't want to be respectful of persons. Like, if I knew what some people tithe and all of a sudden they look like they had an upset stomach. In the service, I'm like, oh, God, what did I just say? Mm -mm. Love y'all. Might not like what you do sometimes. But I'm not going anywhere. My daughter's the only one clapping. I love that. I love it. Love it. So when you go to Scripture and you realize people in authority over us that are good, godly character, they've been through stuff, they're teaching you revelation of how they've overcome, and, and, and we feed you what we're feeding on, and, and, and we can't come with one favorite message that everybody's passing out over in the, the entertainment church, uh, but then when everything's settled, um, if, if you're not pastored, you're, gonna, you're not going to have good character. You're going you're gonna to stunt your growth. Wow, I'm really exalting the pastoral office today. Well, the thing about it is I've been under a pastor for the past 34 years. You, you can't just have your own Bible study and develop into the full will of God for your life. You have to be under the pastoral ministry. They help develop you. They, they instruct you. And again, the local church is like, you know, a really big family. And so sometimes there's, there's different tones about a service. There's different things that are taught and in variety. But, but if you just like one message, you're going to think that pastor doesn't have it that day because I taught you about tithing. You're like, I'm not running about tithing. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to run a victory lap about tithing. But, oh, you want the sweet spirit of God to move. Move, Holy Spirit, move. Well, he's telling you move. Would you move? Why don't you move? I've been in services before. I didn't feel a thing, but I saw my leader do something. I, and I did whatever my leaders. And before, before long, I mean, you'll know when it's a sense of the Holy Spirit is, is when the congregational, the congregation will, you know, participate in in the vast majority. There's going to be some that are not quite uh, in, developed in that, not developed, have been exposed to. But then if there's just somebody making all kinds of clanging and shouting and screaming and, and, and no one else is going with it, 
someone's just, you know, got a little excited and I might have gotten a flesh. It's okay. We have people to deal with you. <laughs> I'm just kidding. We just have come, some come over there and, and calm you down. <laughs> what? Oh, yeah, we got some harvest bouncers in here. There's some ladies in here. Man, I'm going to act decently in order. Don't want them coming after me. A little bit humorous tonight, but I hope, you know, you're able to digest this message. Because, again, let me conclude this. Know those who labor among you. Also know the leaders who are over you in the Lord because they warn you. They kindly reprove you, and they exhort you, and then hold them in very high esteem and affection, uh, intelligent and sympathetic appreciation of their work, and and be at peace among yourself. When when there's good leadership, there's, there's nothing like that peace. If there's a vacuum for leaders, if there's, then that's when people start contending and start striving for positions. There. And you know, if there's, they're not good enough leaders to, to step in the middle of that and, and say, no, we're not going to do this. No. Because I want to come to a place that God wants to come to. I know He's in us. But I want Him to enjoy to come to Harvard Church on Wednesday nights and Sundays and our outreaches and wherever we go. God's big on spiritual authority. He is. And, and it's not just talking about the pastor. It's like, uh, uh, how, how, do, how do you respect the police these days? I'm not saying the fringe, terrible ones, but there's a whole mass that's good. Don't get caught up in the fringe of the bad white, the bad black, the bad whatever color, because the majority, are, they're just downright good people. But those pundits, and even you get ministers on the TV creating schisms and division. That is not good leadership. Latina, I told her I wasn't going to give her credit anymore for it. She said, we, we have freedom of speech, but we don't have freedom to divide. So the next time you're getting ready to say a, a, a send a Facebook post out there or Instagram or whatever, think about the consequences, the end result of what this could do to the body. I've had people walk away from me because I wasn't political enough. I've had people walk away from me because I was too political. I've never been political. I said, you know, just find the Word of God and see what lines up. Vote your conscience, and I won't tell you to vote for. I've had ministers come at us saying, it just, I mean, literally, almost make me say I'm going to go to hell because I don't get real political. Well, this is, I might have a different church than you do. This church has every race, every culture, every age, and if I was going to get politically one-sided, what would that do to this church? It would polarize the harvest rather than win and develop the harvest, populate heaven. That's all, Stan. So I know I just sort of share with you some things that I don't really condone, but I'm going to stay true to what God's called us to do, keep the word at the very forefront. And if you want to come to this church and get that new fresh revelation of something you've never heard before, you're not going to hear it. There's nothing new under the sun, the word says. However, your level of development and God's fresh revelation giving you more understanding into the basic principles is what we want. You see people darting from meeting to meeting to meeting to to just get get supercharged and 
and, and I, get, I get concerned about the younger generation who really likes, uh, well, let me say it like this, because I've talked with the next generation and they say, you know what, that, this generation's getting tired of that now. They want the authentic and they want the real. Because you can only live on candy for how long? Oh, Lord. He's talking about my way I eat candy now. No, I'm talking about if you just live off of hype or, or motivational speaking and there's no depth of the word or moving of the spirit, when, when, the, when the storms come, this can be tough. Storms and challenges come to all of us and get ready for the next one because it's coming. I rebuke that, and I don't receive that in Jesus' name. How many scriptures do you want me to give you before you believe that? Why would God say, and this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith? Why would he say that overcome? Because we're going to be overcoming. Stop saying, I don't understand why I'm going through this. You're overcoming. What did I do to deserve this? You're overcoming. Now, there's, how many have ever made bad decisions and you are the only, you're the person that made yourself in that situation? I, listen, we all are there, but a lot of times when we grow and develop, you, you know, this is a victory that overcomes the world even what? He's called us to be more than, he's called you a conqueror. What does that mean? <laughs> you don't even say it. You're going to be conquering some stuff, but he's going to help you. Father, thank you for your word tonight. Thank you for helping us. God, I repent if I've ever stepped over bounds or not acted appropriately as far as what you called us to do. Or, Father, I just rededicate my life to your calling for me. Father, thank you for it. If we've committed any sin of commission or omission, forgive us. Remind us of things you, you wanted us to do and we haven't done yet. Have mercy on us. Refill us with your Holy Spirit, Father. Grant us grace that we can move forward and apply our greatest takeaways from tonight. In Jesus' name. Every head bowed, eyes closed. If anybody here today, tonight I was going to dismiss, but if you... Um, were to die today, do you know you'd go to heaven? Are you for sure? If you're not sure and you'd like to receive Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, He's the only way to heaven. I can't even, and the team sang tonight, He's the way, the truth, and the life. No man could get to the Father except through Jesus. But the Word of God says you need to receive Him as your Savior and declare Him as your Lord. But take a look at me right now. And I want some input right now. What does it mean for Jesus to be Lord? Maybe I can rephrase a question. Do we really have a choice in where we're supposed to live if Jesus is Lord? Do we really have a choice of what church we go to if Jesus is Lord? Are we supposed to take another job before we find out if they ever even have a church I've seen people backslide because they went and took a promotion over where God wanted them in the will of God just for a dollar. That God wants to promote you and he will. He'll take care of you. But your increase will come in the will of God. Because riches aren't just money. It's called health. It's called community. It's having good friends. It's, man, we're standing together in, in, in times of trouble and, and we get through things. Let's all pray this prayer out loud together. Say, God, I believe Jesus is your son. I believe he died on a cross for all my sin. And I believe on the third day that you raised him from the dead. Jesus, I believe you're alive. I ask you to be my Lord today. I receive you as my Lord. I repent for my past. I'm sorry. I ask you to forgive me. And now I proclaim, Jesus, you're my Savior. And Jesus, you are my Lord.
Father, now let me pray. Father, I pray that you show, and as people contemplate what happened tonight, that you'll show them uh, the most effective way to walk out this word, to be a doer of the word, not hearer only. In Jesus' name, amen.